Welcome to the Permaculture Practical Series on making compost. Today we're going to bring you through all the steps that you need to make compost uh, for your family or your farm or your garden. Uh, so what we're going to do is first talk about where we get resources or what products that you might put into your compost. Uh, so on the internet a lot of times you're going to see people talking about an optimal recipe. And that's nice to think about but a lot of times on our farms and especially throughout the year we're not able to get that specific recipe. So for instance here, if it's in the rainy season, wow, I can get a lots of greens. Things are growing really well. But when I go, I transition now, it's our winter time in, in Asia or into the drier season, it's really difficult for me to get enough greens. Yeah, so in that, in that instance, I would have a pile that would have a slightly different uh, relationship. But I'll make the best compost I can make for the time of year that I have access to resources. Then we would also think about, then if I have better access to resources in a specific time of year, that would more so be the time of year to make my compost. And I can store my compost for the time of year when it's not easy to make, right? Uh, equally, uh, in the rainy season, I can have my compost pile. It rains on my pile basically for free and I don't have to water it so much. But, <coughs> oh, wow, biochar. Um, <laughs> good product. So uh, the other thing is that if it's in the dry season, then I have to sit and water the pile all the time, which is gonna take my time, energy to uh, water it. So think about, the time of year at your farm, you're gonna to wanna to make it. So maybe if you're in a temperate climate, that would be after your growing season. You've, uh, right before winter, you can uh, clean up your garden, make a nice long-term compost pile, let it sit over the winter, and it's gonna be ready for you at the uh, spring, right? So this is uh, reasonings that we might do things. So here we went around the farm. Uh, we, this is our composting area. Uh, think about from a permaculture perspective, where is my composting area in relationship to where I want to use it? So if I'm gonna use it in my garden, and it should be near my garden. So right here, it's near my garden, it's near my food forest, it's near my nursery. And I also have access. If I, uh, as we make our garden being, being very large, we make a, a lot of compost. Uh, it's a big farm. We need to be able to get the waste products from other things into this area to be able to uh, stockpile waste. And then we can make, make our compost. And we also need to be able to move it, say for wheelbarrows. So here would be more, more of a in permaculture, we would describe this as a soft scape. It means it's not really a road, which is hard packed or, you know, like the clay hard packed road there. So that's more of a hard scape. And then the hard scape allows me to come in with the soft scape. And then obviously there's a path going into the food forest, the path going to the garden, right? So you're looking at your pathways, so hard scaped to soft scapes to paths. So now we have this access or accessible area here we have um, a material that comes from a local farm about three kilometers from us. There's a very large mushroom farm. They have like 50 employees that work every day. Uh, they make uh, bags, which we'll see on the mushroom course, but they make uh, 12,000 bags a day. So it's a big farm. And then they sell those and, and they have a large grow out uh, farm also. When they finish the mushrooms and they sell them to the market, they take the bags, they, they take the substrate and they, they put it into a pile and they don't um, value it. They don't utilize it. And um, for us, uh, it's a great resource. Uh, it's not 100% composted. Maybe I would say 50% composted material. Mushroom substrate, it's gonna have mycelium in it from the mushrooms. In this condition, it's not the right growing environment for mushrooms to flush. If I was to take it and uh, control it better, you probably could flush some mushrooms, but they've already had the production cycle of the mushrooms. So it's not gonna be uh, great for that. Still has mycelium. Uh, we have hay uh, from, a, uh, we were doing a natural building product project. We took down a, a hay bale wall uh, that we uh, didn't really work out. And uh, so we have a waste product. From our own mushroom farm, we have some of our mycelium uh, bags that you can actually see the mycelium better. So here, and we can break that apart, right? Utilize it in, in our compost pile. From a greens, we want to get greens, right? Well, um, especially here in the tropics where it's a dry, uh, dry in the, this type of season, it's really hard for me to get greens. Where do I get them? So uh, we can grow, so this is napier grass in the back. So I grow napier grass. It's a uh, common name is elephant grass. So it gets three meters tall in a year. Uh, a lot of biomass, so we can cut that and chop it to have greens. Uh, if, if we didn't have the avail availability of grass as much or something like that, you can use grass clippings also from like your uh, lawnmower that makes great compost. Uh, but we can use manures. So when we think about a cow, a cow walks and he eats grass. And in one day, a cow may eat something like 100 kilos of grass. 
he digests 100 kilos of grass and um, he uh, converts that 100 kilos into maybe two uh, kilos of growth, right? And then the rest comes out in manure and it's compressed into 20 kilos of manure. So you get 20 kilos of manure, two kilos of cow from 100 kilos of grass, okay? So then if we take that 20 kilos, that's basically condensed, yeah? Like 90 kilos of grass. So that would be the equivalent, if I take one sack of manure, of having to go and cut and take 90 kilos of grass and put into my pile, uh, like say physically. So we can then see the, gra the, the cow to a certain extent as a pre-composter. He's like pre-composting and he's also inoculating it because the bacteria that are inside of the cow's stomach in the fermentation process are the same bacteria that are breaking down our compost pile. So when we make a compost pile, we're almost making like a cow's stomach and creating the conditions for it to keep composting. So when we add in the manure, it's like an inoculant. It's like a cheese starter. And then that inoculant, those bacteria say, hey, new food, let's eat it. So that's what we're gonna try to make. We're gonna try to make the conditions for airflow, water, right? In order to get those effective microorganisms, uh, as we call them, EM, to start breaking down again, the new food material. We're gonna give them some, uh, the older material, which is manure, our starter. We're gonna give them some really good material, which is the greens, and they're gonna eat that. And we're gonna give them some harder material to break down, which will be our carbons. So once they're alive and prolific, they don't wanna die like anything else. So first, what are they gonna eat? They eat the ice cream first. <laughs> so they eat the dessert. After they eat the dessert, they'll eat the not so great food. So they'll be able to break down things like this. So these leaves and stuff, are hard to break down. But once we get enough microorganisms that are living, they'll then eat the lower grade food. So that's why we're having kind of like a balance. And we're gonna layer that in, show you how to create the layers to have the optimal growing conditions. This is uh, based on 18-day uh, Berkeley from Berkeley University. They did a graduate student program to make all the different types of piles in order to um, figure out what was the fastest way to make compost. So we're gonna look at that first, the fastest way to make compost, which is appropriate when I start my farm. But in a long-term condition, I need to think about transitioning to uh, other uh, systems. So medium-term compost piles and even long-term. That way we let nature do the work. So over one year, nature will compost it without flipping. If I flip every other day in 18 days, I, I can make compost. If I never flip, but wait, I still get compost. So this is a thing that we try to start with short term. We're gonna to try to transition to long term. We'll look at those later. So for right now, we're gonna go on the farm, take a little ride on our farm truck, go back to the back of the farm where we have, uh, my father-in-law has a cart, uh, corn farm, and there's a basically corn stover, and we're gonna get that and use it, utilize it as a browns layer. And uh, uh, it's a farm waste. So what we wanna to try to look for is waste or things that have very low value uh, whether that was in a temperate climate, you might have lots of leaves. So I, I pick up all my leaves and I can make a big leaf pile, but I also can utilize those leaves in my compost. I can utilize gl grass clippings. Maybe I cut my, my, I cut my grass or my neighbor likes to cut his grass, has a bagger. And you say, hey, can I have your grass clippings? These would be things that we would look for to have low value. And we're going to process them, if you will, the system, the pile. It's going to make it into a high value product or compost. We turn compost then in another system say our nursery or our garden, into a vegetable. Again, a higher value. So this process is taking low things, moving them through, a, a, I say, a system to higher value. So let's go do that, and then we'll show you how to layer it up. This is a farm waste. So after they process over here what we had, the, the corn from this year's corn harvest, uh, they'll bring in a machine, they'll de-husk it, We'll end up with this as a waste. They'll take the grain, sell the grain. Uh, so at this point, we can take this. It's uh, been here for, since last year, and it's been rained on, but it's a really hard product. Uh, corn cob is really, uh, really dense, right? And if they just leave it like this in this state, it pretty much just volatilizes back to the atmosphere. Um, it doesn't really break down into humic material. So what we want to do is take this, uh, and we want to get this material uh, to be able to make new, new plants for instance. So in this instance, we're gonna convert this to our um, vegetable garden through the compost pile. So the compost pile, and we do the work with composting to be able to get this to a usable state. If I just put this into my garden, it would act as like a mulch. 
Okay, so I could use this as mulch, no problem. Over a long period of time, it would volatilize and break down because the soil will eat it from the bottom. But for the most part, this will just sit there and it doesn't break down, okay? So we're gonna see that, see how the process, we can convert this within 18 days to beautiful soil. But sitting for a year, it doesn't do it, okay? So that's where the why we're gonna make a pile and why we're gonna be particular about how we make the pile to be able to take something that's really difficult and convert it. And it's, uh, see how fast nature can do it. In 18 days, it takes that and turns it into soil, okay? So when we put the nitrogen or greens into our compost, what we're trying to do is when the green is on the tree, as we see it there, right? Um, or here, the leaf has just fallen down, still green. The green represents nitrogen, so it still has nitrogen in the leaf. But when it sits, it'll volatilize and the nitrogen will go back to the atmosphere, the carbon's left, right? So what we wanna try to do is replicate what happens in like a cow in a fermentation. If we can get the green into the pile, then it'll uh, start to activate and then the, the nitrogen will get locked in the pile. So we'll have a high nitrogen compost. That's why we're trying to get the greens fresh into the pile. So if we can't do that or we don't have access to enough greens, well, uh, manures are green, okay? But they're also inoculant. They're also the microorganisms. So they're green and microorganisms, right? Densify. So uh, high in NPK, the things we need for our, our soils. So that's what we're gonna do, try to get as much as we can. We'll go up to the cow house. Uh, we'll see the food source that we use. Uh, we can feed the, the green to the cow, take its uh, manure, but we also can put fresh greens in our pile also. And they help to give a little bit more airflow. So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, so that'll be the napier grass and then we'll get that. After that, we'll come back, we'll take a little break. So we've uh, got our things together. Uh, it's an organizational issue. We'll probably add another bag to the biochar. It's doing really good. We'll take a 15 minute coffee break. We'll come back out, we'll layer up the pile. And basically within your morning session, you've, you've made two good products that we're then gonna use to add together with our verma composting that we do with our worms to make what I call a designer potting mix. That designer potting mix gets our plants started really nicely. So when they go into the garden, you've got that like jump start. Basically think about plants like kids. You get them really good in adolescence, they're gonna, they're gonna do much, perform much better in their adult age because they had really good nutrition when they start. If you don't take care of them when they're young, uh, the yield is uh, directly affected when they're older. So if after they got a bad start and you gave them the best food, they still won't make the same yield as a great start with average food. And if you get a great start with decent food, well, guess what? You got a really great yield, right? So that's what we're looking for. A really good start, a good consistent, which will, when we mix our compost into our soils in the garden, we'll see how we're looking for a consistent amount of food. So let's go. <laughs> so a lot of the people watching are probably gonna be in a temperate climate. So you have uh, temperate grasses, but in a tropical uh, area, they have tropical grasses. And so a tropical grass can grow up to three meters tall. This is not in flower yet. So they'd actually go about another meter and turn the flower to create seeds. Uh, but this is a good size that we would cut. The common name in Asia is elephant grass. So right now, if we put this into our pile just like this, man, how can I turn the pile? It's gonna be all impossible. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna turn on the chipper and we're gonna chip this. 